Whereas when we go to SynCam2 and fuse it to Minisog, this happens to be actually from an intact mouse brain, uh, and the, the uh, gene was put in by a, in ut utero electroporation. So this is something where we recovered from a whole mouse uh, using fluorescent proteins as a range finder to help us find the neurons that picked up the DNA, uh, then going to the electron microscope. But here's a, a density that uh, we think from the photoconversion, and next to it is a synaptic terminal. So this argues to us that this is postsynaptic because it's next to the presynaptic, but it doesn't itself uh, have a lot of synaptic vesicles in it. And uh, by the way, this is, was electroporated at uh, embryonic day 15, and uh, all this EM and the sacrifice and so on was done uh, at a P21 mouse. So this shows the genetic encoding working through the, through the uh, early life of the animal. So the net conclusion is, for us, it's looking, I mean, we have to do a lot more statistics, but pretty consistently we see SYNCAM1 tends to be presynaptic. When it gets put into any synaptic cleft, SYNCAM2 is postsynaptic, which is nice and easy to remember, one, pre, two, post, uh, and so on. And it's an example where I think if you had high ultra resolution optical, it would be a little tougher to do this type of problem because you'd have to have an independent marker of pre and post. I mean, here it's just advantageous to be able to see all the other stuff. You can also see other synapses that are untouched, and you can see the synaptic ves vesicles in a straightforward way. Uh, with optics, you would have to be, you'd be looking at one color of red dots, and you'd be trying to see another pair, bunch of green dots, and correlating them and guessing which ones were synaptic and which are not. It's so much easier when you have the whole EM. Uh, and it um, doesn't require the, the, the fancy uh, optical equipment that uh, is necessary for super resolution. Turning now to the uh, question of uh, I imaging inside intact animals with uh, optics, uh, particularly mice, uh, I'm reminding you again that less than 600 nanometers penetrates very poorly. So just to remind you, I have a little demonstration here. We have two laser pointers, right, red and green. Green is actually a lot brighter to your eye because not because our eye is more sensitive to green. If I take these two lasers and try to shine the green laser through my finger, you will see nothing come through, even the thinnest part of my finger, whereas if I use the red laser pointer, at least some red light will diffuse through and come out. And I hope you can see my red pinky, right? Come through. So that's, uh, you know, just uh, this is at 640 nanometers or so, and this is at about 532. So that just tells you, uh, the, reminds you of the tremendous absorbance of hemoglobin that makes most of us pink and that we have to get beyond uh, to do imaging. And so uh, we actually eventually gave up trying to push uh, classic coral derived proteins beyond 600 nanometers. We have finally gotten to 600 nanometers and I think that's it. We just barely got to a usable wavelength to get further. Uh, we decided to just change tack and go to uh, 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 proteins that have we external chromophores. And there are plenty of pigments that absorb beyond there, particularly the phytochromes from plants, uh, blue-green algae, and bacteria are light sensing, a little bit like the phototropin, but at much longer wavelength, and the whole separate types of biologists study them. Uh, they had never been uh, considered to be particularly, none of them are fluorescent, they are instead used again light to control gene expression to tell a plant which way is up and whether or not to open its leaves and petals and all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, by, they bind uh, some sort of heme-derived cofactor, which varies from organism to organism. And we were attracted to the bacterial ones because they use biliverdin as their chromophore. Biliverdin is the first breakdown product of heme, and it's something universally made in all aerobic organisms because they, we all have heme, and we all break down heme with heme oxygenase to make biliverdin. And from there on, different organisms treat the biliverdin different ways. Mammals reduce it to bilirubin, which eventually gets excreted and is part of the, um, res partly responsible for some of the color of our excretory products. Uh, uh, bacteria, uh, plants and cyanobacteria turn into other cofactors and get put into the phytochromes, but the bacteria still use biliverdin, and that means that since we all produce about a quarter gram of biliverdin every day, mammals, uh, human beings do, and uh, mice proportionately to their body weight. Uh, therefore, biliverdin is available to some extent endogenously. And by taking this phytochrome again, throwing away all the signal transduction domains, 
and mutating it heavily uh, through a long process that you can read about if you care. For the details, we eventually got a protein that absorbs its 684 nanometers and emits its 708. And 708 is just barely over 700, so I can legitimately call this an infrared fluorescent protein. And as a small example of what we hope will be many other f applications to come, here's uh, a transfection just of a liver in an intact mouse, a sort of stupid proof of principle, showing that if you uh, put in uh, the fluorescent protein into an intact mouse uh, using an adenovirus, it naturally transfects the liver, which is the standard tropism of adenoviruses. And you can get a nice fluorescent liver th visible through the skin of the mouse. Uh, the mouse has been shaved, but nothing more. Whereas the previous best coral-derived red fluorescent protein, highly touted at the time as being great for in vivo imaging, gives you a far weaker signal that is even after five-fold brightening by, in the computer to enhance its <coughs> intensity, is still barely visible compared to the infrared fluorescent protein. And for us, GFP is totally useless. I know there's some claims in the literature that GFP is very visible through the skin of a mouse. For us, we get a lot of autofluorescence and don't see much signal. And particularly in a highly pigmented tissue like the liver, uh, there is no hope. Uh, so uh, we think that this has you know, a lot of uh, obvious applications, at least in mice. And so here, by taking the fluorescent proteins that everyone was used to using in the visible, I hope to have shown you some degree in which Shao Kun has particularly, and by the way, he's on the job market, uh, has managed both to go toward the EM and fill in this nanoscale, mesoscale gap, uh, as well as to go up toward uh, whole body imaging in the centimeter, uh, millimeter to centimeter range. But as I said, for human beings, we want to go back to synthetic molecules not involving gene transfer. And in my case, I would prefer to uh, work with something that's an intrinsic widespread disease mechanism rather than the accidental expression of a particular epitope that we, have no, that we don't know why a, a cell should want to express. Um, and I particularly want to emphasize the need for amplification, as always, because the very best imaging techniques that are, I mean, in the sense of not, I, I mean, I particularly like magnetic resonance imaging because it, it doesn't involve radioactivity, doesn't require hot isotopes, has high spatial resolution, will image through an entire human being very nicely, but it's not very sensitive. It, it's, it, you need a lot of probe uh, to make a, a positive signal, particularly the positive signal is usually done with gadolinium as a relaxation agent, which makes the water protons relax faster. And you need on the order of several tens of micromolar gadolinium to accumulate to begin to see a, a convincing signal over background. And that's an, quite a bit of stuff tens of micromolar. Very few, if any, cancer markers are available at that concentration. And you're lucky if you get tens of nanomolar. Uh, uh, so that's why we feel we need uh, amplification. And um, fluorescence has been mighty good to me in my career. But there comes a time you have to uh, admit that for, say, uh, thick, fat, pigmented human beings, uh, we need to use MRI or something like that. And if we can concentrate MRI or radioactive agents, we might as well try to concentrate therapeutic ones as well. So uh, our molecular target has been proteases. And there are two possible um, ways of motivating that. One is that proteases are mighty important. Extracellular proteases are important because most cancer deaths occur due to metastases in distant organs, not the primary tumor. And in order for a primary tumor to cells, cells from there to metastasize, by definition, they have to break out of this initial mass, get into the bloodstream, and wander to a distant site, and break out again across that membrane and colonize some distant organ. And that requires that they chew their way through the extracellular matrix, through the, through the uh, basement membranes, et cetera. And that requires the overexpression and activation of proteases to chomp their way through this uh, dense material. And this is so well known that uh, even on a commercial website, I can find a cartoon that nicely summarizes, in, in fact, featuring our favorite players at the moment, MMP2, matrix metalloproteinases 2 and 9, are so-called gelatinases that attack slightly degraded collagen. And they are uh, some of the most well-identified uh, members of this proteolytic family. It doesn't just come from the tumor cells. They, in turn, inf invoke an inflammatory response, and a lot of the Inflammation also produces uh, uh, macrophages and so on, produce more of these MMP2s. And there are other roles like releasing uh, angiogenic factors and so on that are not particularly shown on this, but are also very important. 
But the real reason that we work on proteases is because of a particular molecular mechanism uh, that we came up with based on this no, well-known uh, observation that polycationic peptides, uh, typically with a large number of arginines in them, or arginines plus lysines, uh, have this stickiness towards cells. And more than just stickiness, if you have such a polypeptide, a small peptide, attached to a payload that you would like to get inside cells, that uh, material will stick to the outside of cells, particularly well in tissue culture, and then uh, get endocytosed. And then a small amount of what got endocytosed somehow often seems to be able to escape into the cytosol and nucleus. Often that's a rather small fraction, however. And there is some controversy about this mechanism. There's I, actually more than a little controversy. Hundreds of papers have been written arguing about this mechanism. And there are some people uh, with some evidence that under some conditions, you can bypass the endocytic pathway. But that's not our issue right now. Uh, the polycation has had a number of sequences uh, advocated. We tend to use the simplest that was particularly introduced by Paul Wender, uh, which is just a row of arginines. If, you, if it's got to be highly cationic, just pick a bunch of arginines. Uh, D amino acids work just fine. There is no stereospecificity. If anything, D amino acids are often better because they are not as red readily proteolized. And the payload can range from a small fluorescent tag up to a full-size nanoparticle or even a virus. However, this system largely mainly works in tissue culture. And even there, it's not that, that good at getting things into the cytosol and nucleus in a robust manner. Uh, a lot gets into the cell. It is actually quite uh, difficult to use in vivo. And uh, of course, the, the observations that it worked well in tissue culture provoked at least the formation of at least three biotech companies, hoping that this was going to solve drug delivery problems. And every one of those companies died. Uh, and I was on the SAB of one of those uh, and watched it fail. And one of the reasons was uh, that these molecules don't really have much selectivity. And if you try to do it in vivo, inject fluorescently labeled peptide into a mouse at low doses, what you get is a fluorescent tail vein. So at the site of injection, it gets taken up in the endothelial cells. Later on, some of it gets off there, ends up in the liver. Uh, very little winds up in tumors. If you try to raise the dose to get some into the tumors, the mouse dies uh, of uh, respiratory collapse. So uh, we felt that we need some selectivity here. And we need to, some way to, the way nature tends to turn things on, typically, is you get some constitutively active process. And then you inhibit it. And then you take away the inhibition when you want to activate. And so adopting the same procedure, how do we stop this polycation from doing its normal thing when it can take all sorts of payloads into the cell? So we reasoned if it loves to stick to negative charges on the surface, let's give it its own internal negative charges to keep it pacified. And stick them together, hold them together in proximity so that they would nicely form a hairpin. And to our delight, this does indeed block, pretty much block the uptake of the cation. It is taken with the presence of this inhibitory polyanion, which for us is just a row of glutamates of the same number as the row, number of arginines, nine. Nine here, nine here. I'm sorry, I, I think I drew eight in the cartoon. Should be nine. But we need to hold them in proximity so that there's a high local concentration. And if we come along with the protease and cut, then they fall apart. And the polycation then is free locally wherever the, the the cleaving activity was. Anything that cuts the linker locally, it's like a local injection at that site of this material, which then jumps into the nearest cells it can find, hopefully the tumor cells or the surrounding uh, inflammatory stroma, and then will do its usual thing just as before. Okay. <clears throat>